Amen. Thank you for your patience and, uh, and your hopeful thoughts. Uh, they worked. So <laughs> uh, anyway, so we're going to be okay, and our, uh, our, our live audience and our live stream audience uh, will be on board. Uh, my name is Kelly Burke. I'm the chaplain here at Campion College, and uh, excited to have everybody here. Um, I'm going to let you know just a couple of uh, logistics. So uh, as you came into our space, um, there's a hallway that you've passed by the elevator that has um, washrooms right there. And uh, um, Kim, who's at the back, uh, can give you a little wave. And myself, Kelly, um, are available if you need anything um, uh, during or following. And then after our lecture, we have a little reception. And it's just out in our student commons. We have uh, a little lower area, and we've got uh, a few treats and great conversations to be had there. So. Uh, to the main event, I'm going to uh, invite um, our college president, Father Sammy Hellowa, up uh, to welcome you. Thank you, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. Um, Sammy Hellowa, president of this college, Campion College. Campion College is after the name of St. Edmund Campion, uh, an English uh, a Jesuit martyr and saint, and uh, our college is situated, uh, first it is federated to the University of Regina, which is uh, situated here on Treaty 4 uh, territory with the presence of Treaty 6. This is an ancestral territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people and traditional homeland of the Miti Nation. On behalf of this college, we are very pleased to host the, uh, the Marjorie uh, Annual Lecture, and so a hearty welcome to all of you who are present here and also who are online watching us. Welcome to Campion College. Thank you. Uh, and next, we'll invite Kathy forward to give us a little bit more about the DeMarjorie Lecture Series. Hi, my name is Catherine Wood, and I'm the Executive Director of the Prairie Centre for Ecumenism in Saskatoon. So I've been asked to give you a little bit more about the history of the DeMarjorie Lectures. Um, so the inaugural the Marjorie Ecumenical Lecture was held in Saskatoon in January of 2013 and was originally started in partnership with the St. Thomas More College Chair in Catholic Studies. The goal of the series of lectures and workshop was to become an annual event during the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity that would bring to Saskatoon distinguished ecumenists from around the world to motivate, inspire, and nurture our own local ecumenical activity and awareness. The series of lectures was dedicated to the fa Father Bernard de Marjorie, a priest of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Saskatoon. Father Bernard has been a leader in ecumenism in Western Canada from the time he was a young curate. In 1959, he heard Pope John XXIII's announcement of Vatican II as a personal charge and sought permission from his bishop to study ecumenical theology at the Angelicum in Rome. When he returned to Saskatoon, he began to establish some close relationships with leaders of the other churches. Together, they built a vibrant ecumenical community in Saskatchewan. In 1984, Father Bernard established the Center for Ecumenism as an ecumenical office of the Roman Catholic Diocese. From the start, it had an interchurch board and mandate. By 1988, the center had matured to the point of formally becoming an ecumenically sponsored center. It is one of the two, only two centers in Canada, and it's unique, it's unique in its focus on local parish ecumenism and ecumenical formation. Last year, the series was expanded to include lectures in both Saskatoon and Regina with co-sponsorship between St. Thomas More, the Prairie Centre for Ecumenism, Campion College, and the Archdiocese of Regina. In this 12th year of the lecture series, the sponsorship has widened to include the Roman Catholic Diocese of Saskatoon and the Saskatoon Theological Union. 
To conclude, I'd like to quote part of Nick Jessen's remarks from January 2013 in the inaugural year of the series. The series was named in honor of Father Bernard de Marjorie. Those who know him know that his greatest compliment is to remind you to stay humble. His own humility is one of the many virtues he has brought to the ecumenical ministry over 50 years. His vision of the ecumenical movement always placed prayer at the center. Spiritual ecumenism, which is fostered in prayer together and for each other, promotes humility about the distinctive aspects of our own faith and life. Father Bernard has taught us at least three things about ecumenism, that the heart of the ecumenical movement is prayer, that the ecumenical movement is an ecclesial movement, a movement of the churches, not just of individuals, and that Christ is the focus of the ecumenical movement. Each of these ideas drawn from Vatican II has given direction and significance to Bernard's ministry among us. We need, should be immensely proud of Father Bernard, whose ministry has exemplified the spirit of Christ and taught us to pray that all might be one. Thank you. Hearing myself quoted from uh, those years back, that was interesting. I, uh, it's, it might be interesting to know uh, that tomorrow is 65 years that, uh, front to the day from when Pope John uh, the 23rd called the, announced the council at that date. Um, and uh, there is currently a gathering in Rome, an uh, Anglican Roman Catholic summit um, of bishops who are, will be gathered again at St. Paul outside the walls to pray for Christian unity at the, the final service of the week of prayer um, and where, uh, where Pope Francis and uh, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will be, will be commissioning bishops to, in pairs to go out to, to serve. Um, so let me turn to my purpose here. I'm to uh, introduce our speaker. I'm sure you all remember uh, Bishop Bruce Myers, our speaker last year for this series. After the lectures last year, I spoke to Bishop Bruce and asked him to recommend potential speakers for our series. His immediate response was that we should look at Karen Peterson Finch. Newly arrived at the Presbyterian College in Montreal, he told me that she is passionate about ecumenism and had just published a book on grassroots ecumenical dialogue. Astonishingly, he said, she managed to get a course in ecumenism offered through McGill in her first year on the job. Anybody who works in academics knows how hard that might have been. As coincidence would have it, I had just received a copy of her book a few days before. In her lectures here this week, she will reference her book, Grassroots Ecumenism, The Way of Local Christian Reunion, which happened, oh, this is it. Um, and her experiences in local dialogue in the small town of Clarkston, Washington. But you will also hear references to ecumenical theory and movements that situate her thought in the wider stream of the ecumenical movement. What she describes in Clarkston is a microcosm of the experience of dialogue across the church. Karen is professor of pastoral leadership at Presbyterian College in Montreal. Presbyterians have three theological colleges in Canada, each within an ecumenical consortia. In Montreal, they teach together with the Montreal Diocesan College, an Anglican college with a United Church Theological Study Program, and with McGill's School of Religious Studies. Karen holds a bachelor's degree in English literature. She then moved to Princeton Theological Seminary, one of the principal theological schools in the Presbyterian Church USA, for a Master of Divinity and was subsequently ordained as a minister in the PCUSA. Her doctoral work was at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington, where she completed a doctoral dissertation before applying Bernard Lonergan's, uh, applying Bernard Lonergan's theological method to ecumenical dialogue. Lonergan was a Canadian Jesuit philosopher and theologian, widely regarded as among the greatest 20th century theologians. Karen then continued her studies of Lonergan as a fellow of the Lonergan Institute at Boston College. Before coming to Canada, Karen taught theology at Whitworth University in Spokane for 13 years. 
I, in conversation over the last day, I've also discovered that she also served in campus ministry there before that. She has published numerous pieces on Reformed theology, Lonergan, ecumenism, dialogue, and servant leadership. Above all, Karen adapts Lonergan's theological method to local settings to support dialogue between lay people in neighboring churches. Her book, Grassroots Ecumenism, The Way of Local Christian Reunion, tells the story of a dialogue series between First Presbyterian Church and Holy Family Catholic Parish in Clarkston, Washington. Beyond the inspiring story of two local churches striving to work, study, and pray together during the pandemic, Karen's book also introduces us to Lonergan's method and shares some proposals for local ecumenical dialogue based on this method. I need to say that my own study of Lonergan was over 30 years ago, and I found it difficult to get beyond the surface to find its relevance for my own work and concerns. However, Karen offers the most succinct, accessible introduction that I have ever read. I am inspired to look at her dissertation to learn more. Karen will be presenting a lecture titled, Lay People as Stewards of Doctrine. However, before we hear Karen's lecture today, let me first re reintroduce you to our respondent, Gertrude Rompre. I've known Gertrude for nearly 30 years since I came to Saskatchewan as a young Catholic ecumenist. I came to Saskatoon to take over the Prairie Centre for Ecumenism from Father Bernard de Marjorie, who became my mentor and friend. As I began to meet people, I swiftly discovered that Catholic lay ministry was alive and well in Saskatoon. Gertrude was one of the leaders among a group of mostly women who served in parishes, the diocesan pastoral center, and other ministries in various roles, including youth ministry, religious education, and parish administration. Over the next years, Gertrude helped to form networks of Canadian lay ministry that began to articulate our authentic contributions to ministry based on Vatican II's teaching on the ministry of all the baptized. Gertrude has been a pastoral assistant and parish life coordinator in the Diocese of Saskatoon and I think it was the Diocese of Mackenzie Fort Smith, yes. After over a decade in ministry, she enrolled in Boston College for an MA in pastoral ministry. She returned to Saskatoon to be campus minister at St. Thomas More and then to develop her current role as director of mission and ministry. Along the way, she has completed a doctor of education at the University of, Liver of Liverpool with a 2018 thesis titled Imagining Identity, Enshrining Hermeneutics of Dialogue and Reflexivity Within the Practices of Canadian Catholic Higher Education. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Reverend Dr. Karen Peterson Finch. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, I'm so honored to be here. And uh, I'm uh, delighted. Uh, thank you for coming out on this evening of snow. And to those of you who are watching uh, from home or wherever you are, we welcome you too. And uh, we hope that you will also be inspired by this conversation we are having. So we begin with uh, the topic, as was told to you, the topic of reimagining lay people as stewards of doctrine. So we have to start with a little bit of what you heard. This, this work that I'm doing now is rooted in actual experience, which is one of the things that makes it uh, essentially fascinating to me and for which I am very grateful. And the background is what we call the Clarkston Dialogues. In June 2018, a group of Presbyterian and Catholic parents whose children attended the Holy Family Catholic School in Clarkston, Washington, made the unusual decision to combine the vacation Bible schools. I, I'm not sure if can, Canada has that same model, vacation Bible school, okay, of Holy Family Parish and First Presbyterian Church. They combined their summer outreach program to families and into one. And this decision, which doesn't happen ever, I think, brought up certain doctrinal issues to the fore. 
And after they got through the conversations with the, sec sec the second graders who asked questions about Mary and Jesus, and they got through these, this time and they said, okay, we need to talk about what we just did and what came up for us when we were doing, doing it. And so uh, the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Clarkston, David Webster, says that these are people in both churches who are generous, gracious, irenic, meaning peaceful, and who like to think. And they decided they would find someone who could work with them on doctrine. Now, doctrine in this pr presentation is going to be very specifically defined. I define doctrine, which is church teaching. I define it as the church's judgments of truth and value. We will come back to exactly what I mean by that, but the judgments of truth and value. So David, Reverend David, he had known me for 20 years, and he knew that at that time, I was, in fact, in Rome, studying at the Centro Pro Unione in the Piazza Navona, studying lay ecumenical dialogue models from the past. And so from July 9, 2019 until July 21, I came down to Clarkston many, many, many times. I drove that two-hour trip from Spokane to Clarkston, and we planned and then conducted three dialogue cycles. And I'm talking about full cycles of dialogues, not just particular dialogues. And there were on three topics, salvation, the papacy, and the Eucharist slash the Lord's Supper. So the first, here's the book, the first chapter of the book tells the story of these dialogues and what happened there in my own research. I was there as they learned their own theology, the theology of their neighbors, they practiced dialogue skills, they differed honestly, that's important, they came together courageously, they deepened their relationships, and they became consciously ecumenical. And this was all during a global pandemic. So this was an experience that I'll be ex exploring for the rest of my career. And what made this possible was um, what I believe are an unusual set. Oh, look, I was ahead of myself. So here you see on the slide, what I have just said, it tells you about the dialogue cycles, the first chapter of GE. It's much more approachable the second time around, isn't it? And uh, what we accomplished. And one of the reasons we accomplished this is because we had an unusual set of assumptions and goals. And I want you to uh, know first that uh, before I explain the assumptions and goals, I want to say that the global ecumenical movement, I tell this to my students at McGill, is like a dog with four legs. They are, they are four. Um, the first is doctrine, which I have called judgments of truth and value by the churches. The second is experience. I, we call this sometimes spiritual ecumenism. This is the fellowship, the relational aspect of interchurch life. Then the third leg is structure, and this is the question of if we move to visible unity, which I believe is the goal, what kind of structures would we use, and how do we get from the structures we have to the structures we might employ? And then the fourth leg of the dog of ecumenism is mission. Um, I don't feel like I want to divide between mission as evangelism and mission as social justice. Because in both cases, the churches are announcing the good news of Jesus Christ and then embodying the good news of Jesus Christ. And so mission, whether you think of it as evangelism or as social justice, this is the fourth leg. So ecumenism must have these, it, it must have four legs to walk and to play in the park <laughs> and be a healthy animal. But one thing that we notice is that in many cases, most local ecumenism is focused on numbers two and four, coming together relationally in fellowship and on doing projects together, doing evangelism together, like the Vacation Bible School. But very, very seldom has 
ec local ecumenism been doctrinal, where we come together to dialogue about theology, and not just theology in the broad sense, but doctrine in the narrow sense, which is the particular decisions that the churches have made about what is true and what is of value. And uh, these decisions have often been made in isolation from one another. So I am not saying that it is wrong to have no, um, to, to do local ecumenism with, as a fellowship and a service project. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm wondering why doctrine is left out of this picture. I have never understood this. And as I began doing theology and doctrine with Catholics and Presbyterians together, I understood it even less. Because if doctrine is part of the problem, then it must be part of the solution. And the Presbyterians across the street from the Catholics know very well that the reason they're not under the same roof is because they disagree doctrinally. Nobody is fooled about that. Nobody is, is unaware of that. There's also a tremendous danger of what has been called false irenicism. That's a term that basically means a false peace, a peace that you make when you don't really agree. And one of the dangers of doing local ecumenism without a doctrinal or theological element is the danger of a false irenicism. You aren't talking about your disagreements, and so you might you, they just continue to live. And the life that you share together is not nothing, and I don't ever want to put down the value of the life that we share together in service and in worship and in other things. But those things could be vulnerable if the next day you sat down and decided to have a conversation about how the church could, should be structured and why is there a pope. Wouldn't it be better to talk about how the church is structured and why is there a pope as, long, as well as doing mission together, doing service together? And so in Clarkston, we knew we were doing something different, and we front-loaded these assumptions and goals into everything that we did uh, to structure the three dialogues, three cycles. So the first assumption is that lay people can thoroughly understand the doctrine of their own church and can dialogue skillfully with the beliefs of neighboring churches. Right there is amazing enough. Uh, second assumption, we strongly felt that only a unified body of Christ can successfully carry out the mission it has received from Jesus Christ. Number three, the work of national and international experts on church unity is not finished until lay people in local settings participate in it. I am a member of the Catholic Reformed United States Dialogue, so I know what national dialogue looks like. I've written my dissertation on international dialogue, um, and we always hope those things will flow down to the churches. But why not flip the whole thing upside down? That's what I wonder. Shared witness, service, and justice are wonderful, but unity is not solid unless we are also working toward agreement in doctrine, no matter how difficult the conversation or how distant doctrinal unity might seem. And then local dialogue is the work of the Holy Spirit that can deepen faith in Jesus Christ and commitment to his gospel. The last assumption that I just said highlights a recurring pattern in the dialogues. I found that lay leadership and pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, go together. When you do theology with the whole people of God, you depend on the Holy Spirit you depend on supernatural assistance. There's something about it um, that is almost mystical in a sense. Uh, you can't, you have to have confidence that someone is there helping you to do what you are doing. 
because the work of dialogue is hard and tricky. Um, but this is where we grew a lot in our theology of the Holy Spirit, both churches. We prayed a lot. And one of the most fun things was to see the, the Presbyterians and the Catholics pray together. And at first when they did it, they did it in this kind of sneaky way, like teenagers that were breaking the rules, you know. And you could see they had this kind of glint in the eye, like mischief makers. And then, then the more they prayed, they got into it, and they could not stop. They just loved to pray together. And the Lord's Prayer would break out spontaneously at, at, at uh, exciting moments. Anyway, so also it's important to know that God's Spirit makes the following goals possible. And those were our assumptions. Now here's our goals. To learn the skills of dialogue that make room for the Holy Spirit. And in the curriculum I use, we highlight openness, transparency, and generativity. To understand our own church's teachings better, as well as those of our neighbor church. To come together honestly and respectfully without softening our differences. To study the unity reports that national and international ecumenists have previously written. And to proclaim the gospel together locally by word and deed. These were our goals, and in this book, they are... Um, all of the uh, handouts and announcements and paperwork we used is present as an appendix, and you will see that the assumptions and goals are on every single written uh, item. So what I'm really asking for is for what we call faith and order style dialogue in the local church. Now. I did not really realize how bold this was until recently, until I'd already read, written the book. Because uh, faith and order is, the, is the, the arm of ecumenism where the theologians come together and write the kinds of documents that I'm, that I'm talking about. And that kind of ecumenism, doctrinal ecumenism, the intellectual work of coming together is not very popular right now. It's coming under a lot of fire. Uh, many people assume that as soon as doctrine enters the conversation, the whole thing will shut down. And there's a sense that um, we, we are never going to get where we want to be if we do doctrine. My experience is the opposite. My experience is we are never going to get anywhere unless we do doctrine. My experience is that it doesn't shut it down, it fuels it. And I will say more than that about that in my uh, words in Saskatoon, and I will say more about that in the workshops I give this weekend. But that's where the identification of lay people as stewards of doctrine come in. So now I'm going to do a little piece of theology from the book. And I put this into the book because um, the book is written to equip Presbyterian and Catholic dialogue. But many, many references are there as far as widening this out to Lutheran, to Pentecostal, to Anglican. In fact, and this is, a, this is a shameless plug, and I'm interrupting myself to give this shameless plug. Um, this summer, I spent the summer reading my own book with a group of 14 Catholic lay people and one deacon at uh, St. Luke's Church, or Église Saint-Luc, in uh, the West Island of Montreal. And they are now planning to launch a what's called a multilateral uh, local dialogue, including two Anglican churches, their church, and the local Reformed church. And so I'm, I'm beginning to see this movement go beyond the two traditions that participated in Clarkston. And that's my hope and my desire. But in the book, I wrote to Presbyterians and Catholics to say, there is a theological grounding for you to do this work. You don't have to feel like you're doing something that your priest or your pastor or your tradition would dislike. So I'm going to give you just a taste of that argument from the book. There is support, I demonstrate, in the Reformed tradition, which is my tradition. Reformed is Presbyterian, is uh, same thing. Uh, and the Roman Catholic tradition for affirming the theological judgment of lay people, 
Remember, doctrine is a judgment of truth and value. I only have time to tell you a little bit of this argument, but I can tell you that both traditions use the same image, which is the threefold office of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. How many of you here in the room have heard of this, the, the, the threefold office of Christ? It's very, very good, excellent. It's in the Vatican II documents. It's in the Reformed tradition. I suspect it's in other traditions. You'll also hear it called the triplex munus. In the Hebrew scriptures, three types of leaders were anointed. And they were anointed by this anointing of oil on the head. And so the oil, the word chrism, when you talk about a chrism, you're using the Greek word for an anointing with oil, which is where we get the idea of the name Christ, Jesus the, the anointed. And Jesus, to call him Christ, is to recognize him as the fulfillment of these three offices all at once, Jesus prophet, Jesus priest, and Jesus king. So let's hear how Calvin pulls lay people into the triplex munus. John Calvin of the Reformed tradition says that through the Holy Spirit, who gives faith, every believer shares the chrism that makes the Christ, shares the anointing of prophet, priest, and king. So to Calvin, every Christian is a prophet, a priest, and a king. Every Christian has responsibilities of proclamation, of holiness, and of governance. And Calvin saw a link between the concept of prophecy and the need for sound doctrine, sound judgments by the church in his day. And he taught that lay people, here it is, lay people who listen to the Holy Spirit in scripture could make reliable doctrinal judgments. They could be great stewards of their theological tradition, especially when their level of education was sufficiently high. John Calvin was a great believer in uh, not education of, in theology for people other than simply for the clergy. And so you may be sitting here, if you're Catholic, you may be sitting here well, those are the Calvinists. Uh, we think of them as democratic. That's not really true. They weren't all that democratic in the beginning, but it is how we think of them. Well, I have news for you. There is also a conversation in the Roman Catholic tradition about the three whole, threefold office of Christ and how it pulls the whole people of God into ministry, especially into doctrinal judgment. And so through baptism by the Holy Spirit, let me make sure I'm not missing something here. Oh, I did miss something very important. At Vatican II, the council fathers were looking for a theological course that ascribed significant theological judgment to lay people while at the same time respecting the traditional ecclesiology of the church. And this is how they did this. They wanted to give powers of theological judgment to lay people and still respect the hierarchy. And so they wrote, through baptism by the Holy Spirit, the pope, the bishop, the priest, and the people all share equally the threefold office of Christ. Did you hear that? all equally share the threefold office of Christ. Lumen Gentium asserts that Jesus Christ fulfills his prophetic office not only through the hierarchy who teach in his name and by his power, but also through the laity and their sensus fidei, which is the, the sense of the faith, the appreciation of the faith, also called the sensus fidelium. For the census fidei to function, or for the census fidelium to function, this is from apostolicum actuocitatum. Aren't I getting more Catholic to be able to talk like this? <laughs> anyway, for the census fidei to function, this, this is coming from the Vatican II documents. Solid grounding in doctrine is required in theology, ethics, and philosophy, at least proportion to the age condition and abilities of each. And so we find 
very excitingly, there is a role for lay stewardship of doctrine in both traditions. And I would bet that if you are Lutheran, if you are um, evangelical, if you are whatever community you come from, that there is a logic for lay theological stewardship in your tradition. I feel sure of it. Now, I know that in a Catholic or an Orthodox setting, you may be part of one of the Orthodox churches, the structures of the church are not as fluid. There is a sense that the structures of the church have been given as a divine gift and that they are the best way of embodying and preserving the gospel. But what I have learned from spending time with Catholic Christians is that the way that those structures are inhabited changes over time. And so what Pope Francis is doing with the synod is causing a kind of a change in the way that the structures of the church are being inhabited. And lay people in the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches can be part of those shifts of the way their structures are lived out, just as much as Reformed people, Lutheran people, Methodist people, United Church people can be part of a renewal of their church structures through the activity of lay people as theologians. So you might be asking yourself, if this is here, this theology is here, why don't we see it more often? And so in my book, I identify four barriers to local lay dialogue. And the first di barrier, what could have stopped us in Clarkston but did not, was the idea that such a thing has never been done before. Now that is not true. It is not true at all. And I went all the way to Rome during my sabbatical in 2018 to, to find that it was not true. And I studied there and wrote into the book the story of two local dialogue experiments, one in the living room dialogues in North America. There were living room dialogues here in Canada. Does anybody ever, was anybody ever part of one or heard of one? The living room dialogues. It was Orthodox, Protestant, Catholic. And that was in the 1970s. And in Britain, there was something called Lent 1986, not strangers, but pilgrims. And I am not kidding. In, uh, they estimated that there were 70,000 study groups during Lent 1986, ecumenical home study groups. And it was hooked up to the radio. And so there were, and they say that over a million people participated in theological dialogue in the church setting or the home setting in Lent 1986. So now you, you don't know about this, but the internet has opened up the ecumenical experiments of the past and made them live again. So if your church was interested in doing something like this, you can find it um, through this book that I wrote. You can also find it in the internet. And there's something both sad and wonderful about this because uh, even curriculum from 50 years ago can still be useful, which is, which is good, but it's also bad because it means that the hot button issues that were hard 50 years ago are, and this can be discouraging, still hard today, many of them, many of the divisive issues, despite a lot, a lot of effort uh, through faith and order ecumenism, and effort by some of you in this room who have been, and on this, this uh, film, who have been doing this work here in this region for years. So the first barrier is this idea that no one is, has ever done this before, and it's not true. And I am here to say that it has been done in Clarkston, Washington, and it was literally a life-changing experience. The second barrier to lay dialogue is the lack of a dialogue method. Now, when I say method, and uh, Nick has already shared with you that I am uh, indebted to the theology and philosophy of Bernard Lonergan. 
And when Bernard Lonergan wrote a method for theology, he didn't mean a list of doctrinal topics that you have to do in order. First, we're going to talk about creation. Then we're going to talk about sin. Then we're going to talk about uh, this, that. No. What he, do, what he did is he created a framework for collaborative activity. A method is a framework for collaborative activity. It's, it's not so much a do this, do that, do this. What it does is something different. And um, there's Bernard Lonergan. And I think my next slide will help. Do not panic. <laughs> this slide makes people go, oh, I'm going to run away from your method, Karen. But don't run away, because this looks complicated, but is actually not as complicated as it looks. Um, the next slide will help. But you will see that down this left side, it says operation. He means the way we, the way we learn. So we learn by experiencing, understanding, judging truth and value. That's where doctrine comes in. And deciding. And he says over here are what theology does. And what it does, if you line up your theological work along with the way that your mind naturally works, you will find yourself helped when you are trying to work on theological problems, especially collaboratively. So passing on from that to a simple dis description, this is what Lonergan's method does. It starts with the way that all human beings learn, and we call that method 101. Then it narrows down to what a learning church looks like. That we call method 201. That's Lonergan's idea of the learning church. And then it focuses more narrowly on what a local ecumenical dialogue could look like. And that I call Method 201 Grassroots. So that's basically the hard chapter of the book, chapter four, in a nutshell. And so in, basically, the way that I've used Lonergan's method for local dialogue is not as a prescription, but as a touchstone. It tells you what dialogue looks like when it is going well. It helps you to notice where you might go astray and kind of takes you by the hand and walks you along the road and helps you get unstuck when you get stuck. And I truly believe that this kind of method is useful for ecumenists, whether they are in a national dialogue, an international dialogue, or a lay-led grassroots dialogue. So moving along here, a third barrier, and then a fourth, and then a conclusion. This is the barrier that is, I think, the most challenging in many ways. For lay people, a lack of education. Church people do not know their own theology as well as they want to. This is a statement that I would rest my life on. But to know the theology of your community illuminates so much. To know the differences between what the Catholics believe and what the Presbyterians believe, it, it, it illumines our differences in biblical interpretation. It shows us how disagreements have developed in history. It shows us the values and the priorities that recur in each uh, community. But, however, when there is so much to do just to survive as a church, lay theological education gets sidelined in our communities. And I'm not here to present anyone with a guilt trip about that. However, I did write a book hoping to address it. So in my book, there is a chapter on the dialogue on salvation. There is a chapter on the dialogue on the papacy, there is a chapter on the dialogue on the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. They are tied into Lonergan's method and they are there to help churches do this work in their own context, whatever their context might be. And then this is the fourth barrier. Unless it is surrounded by education, local dialogue raises a fourth barrier and that is the absence or the weakness of legitimation. 
The question of le legitimation is, how are authorities receiving the dialogue and its effects? Is the bishop nervous about the local dialogue? Is the archbishop nervous? Is the presbytery executive in the United States nervous? Is the synod talking about it? Is the general assembly talking about it? Um, and so on. You know what I'm talking about. Legitimation happens when decision makers like bishops or synods acknowledge that the relationship between the two communities is different because a lay uh, dialogue has taken place. But I would argue that doctrinal dialogue actually makes local dialogue more trustworthy and helps to ensure that any progress at the local level has a fair chance to endure and to spread. If you can say to your bishop or to your synod leaders, here's the path of education that we did as we did this dialogue. Um, this is, is showing that you are honoring the context that they feel very strongly about preserving. And so doctrinal dialogue can actually strengthen the relationship between the churches and the authorities in, that in the community. And so I think that we can clearly say we found a way around these barriers in Clarkson. First of all, I had some knowledge of local dialogue experiments, so I knew that it had been done before. Uh, second, I had a method in mind. I was fortunate to have the Lonergan training. So I could see, I looked at the dialogues in a different way and I had a, more peace about them. Um, and it helped me not to have to control them, but to let them go where they were going. Um, we had doctrinal learning and we, uh, we had honest difference. In no way did we pressure each other for agreement. We did the opposite. And we had good relationships between the two clergy, Father Jeff and, and uh, Reverend David. We had a good relationship with the Presbytery of the Inland Northwest. We had a good relationship with the bishop in this diocese of Spokane. And that was all to the good. And by the way, we wrote a church covenant. And that helps that so that we can revisit, revisit, revisit the work that was done there. And the church covenant was sent to the authorities for their signature, for their buy-in. So future outlooks on lay stewardship of doctrine. There is so much more that I want to tell you. I'd love to tell you more about what dialogue looks like, what it's like to practice transparency, openness, and generativity. I'd love to tell you more about the emotional side of dialogue. Uh, when we say judgments of truth, uh, there are also judgments of value you know your values by your feelings. And so these were very emotional dialogues. They were not stiff and formal and doctrinal in the sense of being cold and passionless. They were very passionate. Uh, there's so much that I wish I could tell you, and I don't have time, but I will tell you this, that not just me, but all of those who went through this, and now the group in West Island of Montreal, we want to share the joy that we had in dialogue. We want to share that we saw something happen called seeds of collaboration. That there were moments where tiny agreements that were never seen before appeared among us and we were able to catch a sight of doing theology together in a way that honored both our traditions. So a little bit more about, I'll, I'll, in my workshops at the Prairie Center, I'll be presenting a seed of collaboration. But here's a little bit more just to inspire you. What is a seed of collaboration? It's the germ of an idea that could be shared by both communities without sacrifice of conscience, either way, and that points to our best understanding of the gospel. And these they were God's gifts to us. They appeared in the dialogue. They were precious, and they do happen. And they're new, and yet they're not new. I believe that these seeds of collaboration are the glimpses of a unity as old as the gospel, a wholeness under our brokenness. And you can think of them from a variety of images. You can think of this seed of unity as like an umbrella 
an overarching agreement above our two positions. Or you could think of it as a root, as going back together to the bedrock, to Jesus Christ. Or you could think of it as the end in the middle. In other words, in the middle of time, in the church basement or the parish hall, we are having an experience of what our unity will be like with Jesus at the Supper of the Lamb. Whatever you call this moment of unity, it's real, it changes you, and we experienced it through doctrine and facing our theological differences with courage and persistence and with love because difference plus love makes magic. And that's what we found. And so for now, I would say that doctrine matters. And I would say to you, here's a, my last word for today. Um, what we need to, to support this work so it can keep going is a consistent theology of the whole people of God. In other words, if you want to hold, hand stewardship of doctrine over to lay people, then you need to be really clear about what is our theology of baptism and confirmation and ordination and Eucharist and the, the, the things that form and feed lay people. And we need to have a way of talking theologically across denominational differences at the grassroots level about what forms lay people so that the lay people can do their job, which is to make judgments of truth and value based on their knowledge of the faith, of which they have plenty. So, and don't forget the four legs of the dog. Doctrine, experience, structure, mission. If doctrine was part of the problem, then it needs to be part of the solution. Thank you. Wasn't that an absolute treat? Thanks again, Karen. <laughs> I am honored and humbled to be able to provide a bit of a, a response and a, a reflection to this evening's uh, lecture. Um, as I was preparing to drive here uh, this morning from Saskatoon, a friend of mine wished me well with these words. She says, be safe as in God's pocket. And I thought, isn't that a lovely little phrase? I'd never heard that before. But this image of this being as safe as, as if you were in God's pocket, kind of nestled in, on, in God's heart. And I believe that as we engage in this work of ecumenism, as we are reminded during this week of prayer for Christian unity, we are indeed nestled in God's pocket and there is a real safety and a grace in being in this space of seeking our, our uh, shared understandings, recognizing our differences, but in recognizing those differences in love that allows the magic and the transformation that you talk about to occur. So thank you for bringing us into that space this evening. I believe that there's a delightful paradox that happens when we encounter each other in our various traditions, when we enter into authentic relationship with one another. And the paradox, it's that paradox of encounter that allows us to truly discover the other, while at the same time coming to know ourselves in a deeper way. There's nothing ever lost, as we were discussing before the lecture. As we encounter each other, uh, we discover the other, but we discover our own identities in a deeper way. And I think as you describe the Clarkston dialogues and these two communities coming together, I think we, we saw that they, as Cecil Roback wrote in the foreword to your book, that they made amazing discoveries about each other. 
But I also think that they got, came to some deeper understandings of their own traditions in the process, and that that is a richness that, uh, that nourishes each of the communities involved. So by sharing with us the experience of those Clarkston dialogue partners, and by your careful reflection on those encounters, you have truly illustrated the power of grassroots ecumenism. You've shone a light on the fact that these vibrant meeting spaces can and do exist. And in short, you've given us hope for the ongoing vibrancy of the ecumenical or ecumenical mission as Christians on the front lines. You've really affirmed our belief that lay people are imminently capable of engaging in careful, informed, insightful dialogue. More so, you've outlined a way of doing this. Method 101, Method 201, deeply rooted in Lonergan's theology, but offering us that framework, as you say, to collaboratively, collaboratively act together. In the spirit of encountering your book and encountering the dialogue that you uh, described there, I, I myself experienced that paradox of kind of deepening my understanding of the Reformed tradition through your work, but also going back to my own Catholic tradition. And I did go back to, uh, and good for you for trying to pronounce it because I'm not sure I can, apostolicum actuistitatum, I did it wrong, but it is the decree on the apostolate of the, la of the laity from Vatican II. And that document really, really affirmed, as you outlined this tonight, our call as lay people to that threefold mission of priest, prophet, and king. It grounded us in that affirmation of our role as lay people. But at the same time, I was also reading hot off the press, the synod synthesis document from the synod on synodality, a synodal church in mission. And reading that document alongside of grassroots ecumenism also cre created this sense of resonance, resonance. It was kind of pinging back and forth, back and forth. That leads to this, uh, this insight and that insight. Particularly when we come to this idea within our synodal uh, conversations within the Catholic Church around being co-responsible in mission. One of the key themes that kind of weaves through the whole process of this uh, global synod, really. And so the sense that we are called together uh, to enter into deep conversations in the spirit this idea, this process that seemed to be so novel within the experience of the synod, both at the local and at the global uh, level, really resonated with me with some of the, the method and the experience you talked about in the Clarkson dialogue. That experience of deep listening, that experience of coming together and, and uh, creating processes that allow us to, to encounter to bring in the Holy Spirit, and to, I think, also discern those sparks of joy. Um, within the, the Synod Synthesis Report, they talk about the ecumenical vision that be began the whole synodal journey in Rome, and how the joy of the Spirit was present there. That same theme was th woven, I think, and is woven throughout grassroots ecumenism, that sense that if this is authentic dialogue with an open, generous uh, heart to the spirit, as you say, the, the work of, of lay dialogue and pneumatology walk hand in hand, if we, if we encounter that authentic experience, that joy is there. So thank you for bringing us that, that spark experience you're sharing your experience with us I would like on the record to also thank all the people that were involved in the Clarkston dialogues they were very I think generous in terms of allowing us to share that experience and uh, and serve as catalysts for many more dialogues to come so I'd like if you ever do have a chance to extend our thanks to them as well 
And so uh, we continue this evening uh, with some questions and answers, grateful for the gift of not only the experience that you shared, but the solid framework, the methodology that I think will carry the grassroots, uh, the movement of grassroots ecumenism forward for many generations to come. Thank you, Karen. So we're going to now have a Q&A, and I believe that the microphone will travel to you if you have a question so that it can be picked up on the live stream. And then Karen is generously uh, uh, offered to respond. So uh, anyone who has any questions, uh, the microphone will come to, to you. Hi, Karen. Thank you. It was so great to meet you today. Thank you so much for, for the book and for the presentation. I hope I'm giving you an opportunity with this question to talk about one of the things that you wished you had time to talk about. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so I, I love the line that, um, I, I'm not going to get it exactly right, but the Christian people want to know their theology better than they do. That is certainly my experience. And so People might be nervous either to enter into this dialogue or to allow or encourage other unqualified sorts of people to enter into this dialogue. Um, can you talk about the process? What happens when people who aren't professionals run into a question that they don't have an answer to, and now they have to, they're in a context where they're sort of forced to figure that out. I, I, to me, that's one of the most interesting things about this is, is you're kind of, you're, you're forced to figure it out. And so how does that, how does that look on the ground? Yeah. Thank you. So um, we had something in Clarkston called the parking lot. And it was a whiteboard down in the parish hall of the Holy Family Church. And so anytime there was a question that was far afield, because the questions come, you know, we, we might be working through a piece of, um, of Catholic theology at the moment together when a question would come that was different. Or some of the parking lot questions were like um, purgatory, the meaning of purgatory, uh, how the Protestants respond to purgatory. I mean, it could be anything. And the question would go up on the parking lot to park it there until we had a chance to come back and do some more study with it. And I will tell you, frankly, Brett, the parking lot threatened to take over sometimes. Like, I would always say, okay, I'm going to do the parking lot, and I'm only going to do it for 10 minutes. And then it'd be 20 minutes, and I'd still be doing the parking lot. Um, and I thought this is not a good use of our time, but it was in a way. I mean, I think that um, I think my ideally my vision would be that the dialogue is always surrounded by education in some way. So there were there are various ways to do this. There is the one way of having a teacher like me. That's what kicked it off. Another thing we tried was we tried. Um, flipping the classroom, which is a teaching term, where I recorded a series of videos. Uh, and the, the di those, everyone in the Clarkson Dialogues, and there were more than 30 of us, had to watch the videos during the week, then come with their questions. And they had a form that they filled out, and they came with their questions, and we did parking lot, and then we did dialogue. Um, so one thing we found was there was it was hard work and there was never enough time to say everything that we wanted to say there was never enough time to train in dialogue skills uh, and there was never enough time to answer all the parking lot questions but we did the best we could with what we had and um, we were so blessed I mean we just had a feeling that 
our efforts got multiplied um, in a like a loaves and fishes kind of thing. But but I would I would be creative for churches who want to do this. The book is a big help. Um, and then I would be creative to think where do we find resources that are reliable resources for our traditions. Um, and I was teaching Roman Catholic theology as a Presbyterian to Roman Catholics. And I had a lot of trust from the bishop to do this. And those relationships of trust are incredibly important. And I also had to have a sufficient amount of humility, too, to say, oops, I got that wrong. I'm so sorry. Tell me, tell me what's really accurate. So that's, that's a long and a little bit of a meandering answer. As you see, I really could talk about this all night. I really could. I wouldn't even be tired. <laughs> OK, anybody else? Please, ask me something hard. I'm ready. OK, good. OK. I hope I can put this in the right way, but, um, <laughs> well, it is for me. <laughs> um, okay, so we are all loyal to our traditions. So we're looking for Christian unity. What will we call it? What are we aiming for? Like, everybody wants, is faithful to their tradition. And I don't know if I'm missing the point of this all, but... No, what you are doing is, is taking it to this logical... Yes. Which is oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Our, our live stream will be able to follow us better. Can she say oh, her question? Did you hear what you said? Okay. Oh, okay. okay. I see her. I might have drowned her out. I didn't mean to drown you out. Okay. Okay. Let me think about this for a minute. Okay, what did I say? <laughs> We're talking about humility. Oh, yes, yes. I wanted to praise the question by saying that it is the question of restless curiosity that says, okay, what is the end result going to be of all this? If we love being Catholic, if we love being Presbyterian, if we love being Methodist or Lutheran, and, and yet we want to be one, as Jesus said, we want to have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's Ephesians 4. What is that going to look like, one Lord, one faith, one baptism? So in my class and on ecumenism at McGill, we talk about this for two whole sessions because the models of what things will look like have changed over the years. Um, I hope I can get this right. In the 1961 New Delhi definition of Christian unity at the New Delhi Conference of the World Council of Churches, it was this. All Christians in, every pl in each place in visible unity with all Christians in every place. So let me say that again, if I can. All Christians in each place, in visible unity with all Christians in every place. So what that tells you is that the minds and church families that have been working on this for, you know, since 1910, um, have said that there needs to be something visible and tangible, and I would say structural. But then, and some people have backed off from that, but I, I would never back off from that. And then the question is, first of all, what does that look like? And second of all, how do we, you know, is it going to be that we are, what is, uh, one scholar calls it unity in reconciled diversity. In other words, does it mean that much about our everyday Christian lives and our worship lives looks the same, and yet there is a new common umbrella over us of doctrine, and will there be a structural commonality over us? And the fact is that we really don't know. We really don't know, and history is going to help decide some of that. 
Because, I mean, we're finding that we have to come together now in certain ways, especially in seminary education, because in the, in the North America, we simply do not have the resources to do what we used to do, each of us on our own. So you see, history will help decide some of this. And so what I, what I say in my heart is that what I am doing now is, and what I want the local churches to do is to do what we can now theologically so that when that one church appears, it is the healthiest that we can make it. There's a lot that we can do now in terms of clear thinking about the faith, in terms of loving acceptance of one another, in terms of common insights and judgments and decisions. We can do something to, de to determine the health of that body uh, when it appears. And you know, we'll know, you know how you will know when we're there, it will be a common Eucharist. We will come to the table together. That's when you know. And that's why it hurts so much for people like many of you who have worked so long for Christian unity, but you don't see that common table yet, and that's deeply painful. So the, in the, in the uh, workshop on Friday and Saturday, I'll be talking about the Eucharist and Lord's Supper dialogue at Clarkston. What happened, what the result was, and how painful, and yet how joyful it was. So, excellent question. Um. So, you are a well-trained academic, and consequently, you use words well. But I'm wondering, do you use any visual images to describe the ecumenical dialogue and what that would look like, the whole people of God? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, and that's, I think I kind of blipped over it really fast, but that's what I was trying to do with the umbrella and the root and the end in the middle. Um, did that make any sense? Let me say it again. See, see if it's, yeah. You got that. One image I really like yeah. is on the cover of Bob Dylan's Slow Train Coming album. Yes, Bob Dylan. yes but you have the train. Yes. And I love that because it's one long train. It's slowly coming, and every car is a different part of the body of God. And I think it's an image that we need to talk about in terms of ecumenical dialogue because the train doesn't pull on its own. There's a car, and there's tracks, and I think the Trinity is pulling it. Okay, so the, the Trinity is th the engine. I like that. The tracks could be the doctrines, you know, and the, and the cars need to go together, you know. I like that. I, I support your work, and it's, it, my brain is not as visual a brain. So I think this is an example of that we need many brains on this work. Um, we need... Uh, urban brains and rural brains and brains of all ages and indigenous brains and African brains and Asian brains. Uh, we really do need, I like that very much. Keep doing exactly what you're doing. Keep, keep generating those powerful, helpful images. You are the president. No, so what? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. I got it. Okay, go ahead. I want to revisit the doctrine as a problem and doctrine as a solution, please. Um, the way I understand it is it's a problem because the doctrine could bring prejudice. Okay. Uh, and as a solution, because dialogue could make the doctrine more relevant or maybe more an issue that's familiar to other people or people who don't hold the doctrine. My question is on hope. The hope that you have in dialogue where the doctrine could become so relevant to those who don't hold, hold it by faith. Let, Sammy, let me see if I understand you. No, no, it's very good. No, it's, I wanted it. There, and it's deep, it's hard. This is, 
I was saying this to Sammy before we started, that the dialogue work, the doctrinal work is left brain analytical, but it's also very emotional. And, and there's a lot of emotion around doctrine, what you believe, the judgments that you've made in your life that you put a lot of importance on, they, they bring up your emotions. So are you asking me where's the point where doctrine flips from being a problem to becoming a gift? Or are you asking me about doctrine as an outer facing? Like, yes, maybe it makes sense to those of us who are inner, in the circle that it prescribes, but what about the outer facing where doctrine can be ugly for people to hear? Thank you. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> However, I'm, I'm, I think my question is on the power of dialogue. Yeah, where it can change our understanding of a doctrine that some people don't hold. Like, let's say I don't believe in your doctrine, and as I, you dialogue, I dialogue with you, I might find your doctrine irrelevant for me, even though I may not hold it in faith. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, say, for example, that my tradition teaches that Jesus is not physically, or not... Um, corporeally present in the, the consecrated uh, elements, hosts, um, but is seated at the right hand of the Father. Um, and that's true. Um, so you're saying, so I hope what you hear me saying is that I share with you this judgment I have come to, that my tradition has come to about the truth of the faith. Uh, and then the surprise of it for me was that when I share that judgment with my Catholic neighbor and my Catholic neighbor comes back and says, no, that's not what we believe, um, somehow the encounter makes, makes, first of all, makes these ideas relevant to each other and second of all, we begin to have this little thing that I called seeds of collaboration. We have these, the, the ideas start popping, the creativity starts popping. Uh, the, the, um, the possibility of doing theology together starts popping. And hope comes into the room. And I don't always know I mean, I've seen this happen over and over, but I, I don't always know what to do with it next. I think the next step is lay people um, bringing these theological contributions of theirs to the table where the, the, uh, the professional theologians think they are alone at the table, but they are not. And then that feeds into the common discussion where the Holy Spirit brings us closer to one another in our judgments of truth and value and makes us more Christ-like and more Christ-centered. So that's the vision, Sammy. I hope that's addressing. I think that the conversation, if you have a chance, if you probably can't come to Saskatoon tomorrow, but if you have a chance, those of you who are here, those of you who are watching from home. I'm going to talk there about doctrine as the fuel of renewal. And that's the complementary piece to this conversation. Because really the two surprises of the book are, the first surprise is lay people as the theologians, and the second surprise is doctrine as renewing. And they're both very surprising. So, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much to each of you for being here, and thank you to those who brought me here. I will hand this back over to Nick. So it's uh, uh, my uh, pleasure to be able to thank you, Karen. Um, when, uh, when I called you a year or so ago, or, or not quite a year, 
uh, to, to ask you if you were, would be uh, willing to come here. Um, I was conscious that um, asking somebody to come to the prairies in January is a, is, is a, uh, you know, a big ask, and I thank you for a very, very swift response to say yes. Um, the team has uh, been looking forward to this all year and talking through and reading your book and talking about the book and talking about uh, how, how this can be something that begins new things here too. And, uh, and so I want you to know that that is happening here. Um, and, uh, and we're looking forward to tomorrow's lecture as well and the workshop. So a reminder to everybody, tomorrow, the doctrine as uh, renewal. And the workshop is repeated both in Saskatoon and then here in Regina. It's on the Eucharist, um, Where is Jesus? Uh, so that, for those of you in Regina, that's on, um, uh, on Saturday, 10 a.m. at Christ the King Parish. Um, and uh, we look for uh, look forward to some more really interesting discussion. Thank you, Laura. Did you want to say something? Will the live stream be taped? So the live stream that is occurring tonight and tomorrow's lecture will both they're both on YouTube. They will remain on YouTube. Uh, so there, there's no desire, no intention to take them down. Um, as you can find last year's lecture there as well. Uh, if you, so at the same, you go to the same link, you'll find the, the, the two, uh, as well as a number of other uh, options that STM has on their channel, which are also worth watching. Um, anything else that we need to say? Oh, a reminder, of course, that for the reception. Yes, so please do join us for some uh, treats and casual conversation uh, in our lower student commons. And if anyone's looking for the washroom after this, uh, out the doors, go left, and then go left again. Okay. Uh, a few people have asked about the availability of the book. Uh, we weren't able to put together having a set of the books here, but there is there are two ways. The first one... I may mispronounce, is it Broughton? Is that? Broughton, okay. Uh, there, that would be the place where you can get the book probably for the best price. And the second option is Amazon Canada. It's there, it is I think a little more expensive, um, but uh, that's where they are. So thank you for your interest. It's a new city press, by the way. Uh, the Focolore movement is the, the, it's their publishing arm. So, uh, And Broughton's is out of Toronto. If you need contact information, I can give that to you. Um, but also we have Burns Hanley locally that might be able to connect you. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>